Good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, State of the Economy During the Great Pause with John Mitchell. We had over 225 people register for this, this webinar and uh, it's a great opportunity to have John. We usually bring in John for an annual event in the November timeframe, but these circumstances are unprecedented. It's, it's a crazy time and we thought it was a great opportunity to have John join us for today. So I'm gonna be co-moderating this webinar today. My name is Brandon Laws. I'm Director of Marketing at Zenium HR, and we have Ann Donovan with us. She's the president of Zenium. She'll be running a an interview with John for probably about 40 minutes today, and we'll leave the last 20 minutes for Q&A for, for the audience. We already got a ton of questions that you submitted through the registration, so thank you for that. We'll weave that into the presentation today. And um, at the very end, and even throughout the session, please use the Q&A window uh, to to ask any questions. I might interject during the interview that Ann has with John, if something's relevant to what John says in the moment, but otherwise I'll probably jump back in at the very end when uh, the, the formal interview is done. Besides that, I wanna welcome John Mitchell, a uh, well-known economist in the Oregon area. You're in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho right now, so thanks for, for tuning in with us today. Oh, my pleasure. I gotta tell you, Brandon, as you know, this is my first time doing this. So. Well, we are <laughs> lucky to have you for this first one, so thank you for joining us, John. And I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Brandon. John, thank you for your flexibility and your willingness to jump into new territory. Usually you're on stage for us. I think we've had you um, doing our Ec Leadership and Economic Summit for, Brandon, is it eight or nine years now? I th yeah, I think it's been yeah. eight years and then November will be nine, but who knows if we'll get together. So this <laughs> right. is a good opportunity. This is what we're going to talk in. about. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So so we're, we're delighted to have you participate and interested in the conversation, obviously. This is a, an extremely important topic. So let's kick it off um, with just sort of an overarching um, question around this great pause, as we're hearing it called. Um, it happens so fast. Uh, it's so shocking to many organizations and workers who've lost their jobs. From your perspective, John, where are we as an economy and how did we get here so fast? Well, it's a fascinating experience. I mean, if you think that little more than two months ago, we had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. The, ex the stock market was all time high the expectation was 2020 is in the bag. We're going to have a growth rate near 2% or slightly above that. It looked, it looked good. And now here we are, it basically in free fall uh, in a very short, a, a very short period of time. And what you, I mean, you saw this really induced by shutdowns, stay in place orders, spending was basically you know, reduced uh, dramatically uh, by individuals, businesses, uh, businesses curtailed. Uh, you use the term great pause. You know, I like to think of it as a, a medically induced coma. Stop <laughs> or a neutron bomb. The buildings are still here. The institutions are still here, but the people aren't, you know. And right. so the, we then start thinking about, okay, how do we... Uh, how do we get out of this? But it was it's it's unprecedented in terms of the magnitude of the and the rapidity of the decline. This is like nothing that we have experienced before in terms of what what's going on. Right, right. So, and this is the second economic dip in a little over a decade, right? Um, talk about the key differences between this situation and what we went through in 08, 09. Yeah, if you look at the the, what is now called for at least a while longer, the Great Recession from 2007 uh, to 2009, December 2007 to June of 2009. That was basically you had excesses in the housing market, the housing bubble, problems in the financial sector uh, that really brought that, brought that about. In a sense, that was standard in the sense of recessions are often associated with excesses, buildups in debt, uh, you know, investment decisions gone wrong, that sort of thing, excess inventory. But that's not what we've got going now. Uh, this one 
was basically induced by politicians or by a response to the medical situation, by a response to the pandemic. Uh, globally, you've seen these shutdowns, stay in place orders uh, with accompanying dramatic declines in output, employment, um, and we're only starting to see that stuff now. Right, right. Um, and the federal government acted very quickly, right? So when it comes to policy responses, um, talk a little bit about uh, what the Federal Reserve has done with the central banks, and then uh, what about Congress? Well, one of the fascinating things, as you said, people acted very quickly. I think I'll start with the Federal Reserve. I think that was in part, you know, the Fed learned a lot of stuff during the Great Recession 2007, 2009, took interest rates to essentially to zero, put special lend lending programs in place to support the system. And they reacted very, very quickly this time, I think using some of the learning of what they had done, what they had done before. Uh, for example, on the morning of March 3rd, uh, we had a, a cut in interest rates followed by another later they took the federal funds rate basically down to zero, uh, zero to 0.25. Uh, they have started to support financial markets, uh, the commercial paper market, uh, municipal bond market to for, forestall major financial problems. Uh, the Fed has, I think, done a very, uh, a very amazing job. And they met yesterday. Of course, they had the uh, an open market committee met yesterday. They didn't change rates because they're essentially uh, at zero, uh, but they said they'd use all the tools that they had to try to support economic activity. They have done their quantitative easing again, buying, uh, uh, buying government bonds, buying mortgage-backed securities, and they've, they're brought, buying over a broader, a broader range. They've also, of course, helped fund some of the uh, small business uh, program. I mean, the right. Fed has been very, uh, very aggressive and acted <clears throat> very quickly in this particular situation. Now, you've seen Congress <clears throat> respond as well. The major piece that, of course, got the, the most attention was the CARES Act. Uh, what, they, what they're trying to do is you've got this mandated shutdown, support the individuals, support the firms, so that when this ends, they'll be there to bounce back. Um, a number of elements in the, in the CARES program, uh, of course, you had the, the $1,200 checks mailed out to uh, eligible parties. You uh, enhance the unemployment compensation with the extra $600 uh, a week through uh, August 1st. Uh, you've had, again, the Paycheck Protection Plan for loans to businesses. Uh, funds for hospitals, uh, and and then of course some of that was exhausted very quickly, uh, right. and there was another there was a subsequent round, but it's like deficit be damned, uh, <laughs> we are going to uh, nobody seems to be worried about that at the moment. We're going to fund uh, what we have to do to try to keep the economy uh, and support people during this shutdown to presumably enhance the ability to recover. I mean, that's where we are. And, you know, I, I, I checked some of the numbers. Uh, as of uh, the 17th of April, after the first uh, round of Paycheck Protection Plan, they'd made a, a 1,660,000 loans. Wow. And that's from a, an agency the, through the SBA and the banks that as Wall Street Journal and actually the president said this the other day, that's what they do in 14 years. They did it in 14 days. Uh, so we've seen incredible pressure, you know, on the institutions to get that stuff out. The average loan uh, was $206,000 and 74% of them were less than uh, $150,000. So that's out there, and that's going on again, uh, again uh, at the present at the present time. There's another program that's been authorized that uh, I don't believe has started yet, 
called the Main Street Lending Program, which is another source of funds for, uh, for businesses. But unlike the Paycheck Protection Program, that has to be paid back. Yeah. It, yeah. Can I, I, do you mind if I jump in and ask a follow-up mm -hmm. question? So I, it does seem like the feds, they, they responded really quick and it was really just to prop up and protect what we, what we have. But I'm curious, I mean, we are on such a, a growth trajectory. Do you think that there, there'll be action later on just to, to continue on with that growth that we saw early in, I mean, 2019, early 2020, before this all happened in the first place? You mean the, the, the upturn? Yeah. I mean, we were, we were, it was the longest upturn in American yeah. history. Uh, and uh, that's over. I mean, there we're in a we're in a recession. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. We'll talk later about it, but we're in a recession now. The question becomes: Okay, then a recovery starts at some point in time, uh, and then will we be back on that tra trajectory? I hope so. For for a while, we can grow a lot faster because remember, just two months ago, we were running out of people. You, you know, you couldn't find them. That was the problem, not massive numbers of unemployed and excess resources. So there'll be a period where we could actually grow faster than that trend uh, to absorb those resources and then hopefully get back on that trend. Because basically, I mean, we were going along at or near arguably full employment with low inflation for an extended period of time. And that's not something we had done very often. Right. And a lot of younger people in the workforce don't know anything different. So, you know, that's, that's an right. interesting conversation, too. And I, I think one of the things that's on a lot of small business owners' minds is all this infusion of money and, and the PPP, you know, with forgiveness. The question mark is around what happens after that. So, you know, I think in this three to six to 12 month time frame. That's the big unknown is what else will need to happen to prop up or will it actually have this upturn naturally? Well, if you look at what's going on now, you've already started to see some states are easing up. Yeah. Um, I mean, in one sense, it's gonna be a fascinating experience to watch because one of the virtues of the United States, we have 50 different laboratories that we can try, people are trying different things. We'll see what works or what doesn't, uh, what doesn't work. Will we get a, uh, a rebound in cases? Uh, but I mean, we're starting to ease up now. And I mean, ultimately that will presumably stop the decline uh, and we'll see how people behave as they move out of their, out of their shell-shocked environment, people and businesses, how they, uh, uh, how they behave and right. you know yeah. there's a, a, an awful lot of unknowns out there absolutely well let's pivot a little bit to the data um so so what kind of data do we have about how the con economy is performing right now and there's a couple different sectors that we talked about in preparation for this discussion let's start with uh unemployment claims start with what oh unemployment unemployment okay well one of the things we have to remember is a lot of our labor market data of course it, i mean it's backward looking the most recent uh, data we have at the federal level is the march unemployment data now the march unemployment rate ticked up to 4.4 percent and, and if you and i had been having this conversation you know two years ago or three years ago, and, I, and we said, gee, the unemployment rate's 4.4%. We'd say, geez, that is great. Okay. Right. But we were at 3.5. Okay. Yeah. But that's backward looking. That's March. The stuff really didn't start to kick in until late March. Yeah. And March saw a decline in payroll employment of 701,000. Okay. With a, a significant part of that being, as you might expect, in travel, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, that, uh, that, that sort of thing. When we get the April data, which will be uh, presumably a week from tomorrow, that is going to be horrendous. Yeah. That will, I mean, as of this morning, this is Thursday, so initial unemployment claims come out Thursday morning. And with the numbers that came out this morning, over 30 million people have filed for unemployment in the last six weeks. 
that kind of stuff will be reflected in the next labor market, labor market data. There's, I mean, the labor market data is horrid. Okay. Yeah. But one of the things we also have to remember is that the people who are able to draw the unemployment, there is, you know, a, with that $600 on top of the state rate, the state payments, there is significant income replacement that will presumably help them or through the, through the time period. Yeah, and we've been hearing from our clients who are concerned about getting those employees back because in some cases, employees are making more on unemployment than they were making when they were working. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. There was, of course, a well-known piece uh, this week in the Wall Street Journal from an, Oregon, from an Oregon restaurant owner who said he was having trouble getting people to come back because he got a paycheck protection loan because they're making more money on unemployment. Uh, that may be an unintended consequence. I mean, this stuff was done very, very quickly in an effort to support people. Uh, but that may be a problem if we open up before that ends on the 1st of August uh, with people not being willing to not being willing to come back. But we'll have we'll have to see. Um, there was a presentation by an Oregon labor market economist who said in the state of Oregon, uh, the average person is fully on unemployment is fully re fully replacing their wages with that wow. six hundred. Wow! $600. Yeah, and and you know, there's as things ease up from phase one to phase two to phase three, uh, that employment factor of getting people back to to do a different kind of job, a new normal. That's going to be really interesting to watch and how those oh, it numbers is. fluctuate. It is. But you know, one of the beauties of this, of the, that income support is that's going to help people stay current on their bills, that sort of thing, that yeah. kind of income support. And I think that's, that's very important. Yeah. Well, let's talk about retail because I think, you know, yeah. that's just a whole, we can spend an hour on retail alone. Tell us what your, what your thoughts are about how retail sales will be impacted. Well, if you look at retail sales, the last release, they were, they fell 8.7% from the month, the month before uh, the, uh, that's the March data. And, but it's interesting because um, we could talk about, you know, grocery stores, who've had phenomenal surges in sales uh, as people's shopping patterns changed, restaurants went away. So you had the, the supply chain had to shift to doing stuff, uh, to eating at home. Yeah. And then at the other end, you've got department stores where you saw clothing. If you look at the data for the clothing, uh, clothing stores, sales were down about 50% over the month. And, You've seen the headlines, not to pick on anybody, whether you're talking about J.C. Penney or Neiman Marcus. I mean, legendary names that are at or near filing for bankruptcy. Uh, I mean, huge, huge shifts. Uh, and, you know, outfits like, you know, Costco, of course, have done extraordinarily well. And then you see, you know, the retail sales online or outfits like Amazon, yeah. you know, sword. It, right. it depends on where you are. But when you say people can't spend on certain things, like the restaurant stuff, other than takeout, uh, it, it, it's dramatic, dramatic shifts. And one of the I, I, grocery stores always fascinate me. Uh, because if you, when I was teaching economics, I you said tell students that the grocery store was a miracle because you'd walk in there and without any direction from a central authority, there was milk, there was bread, there were stuff from all over the world. It was fascinating. People, the grocery store chain trying to provide what people, what people want. And now you go in all of a sudden, gee, you can't find toilet paper uh, <laughs> or, you know, hand sanitizer, that kind of stuff, because we've shifted our preferences and the supply chain is still, is still trying to catch up, but it's really, I think, done a remarkable, a, a remarkable job. Um, and yeah. you're starting to see the ads, the frontline workers in the grocery stores and, uh, 
Yeah. And I I wonder how it will change, John, as we move into phase one and phase two of people going back into the workplace and to maybe limited uh, restaurants. What will change about the retail, the grocery stores when that happens? You know, and how will that shift? Well, then you may see a partial shift back, but I think it very well could be a long time. Because if you go back before this started, people were spending roughly half their food dollars on meals out. Yeah. And that's over. Right. And as some say, you know, at the end of this, uh, people are going to be great chefs or alcoholics. Uh, <laughs> or because, both. I mean, because they're, you know, getting accustomed to cooking at home, trying different stuff. And there might be that residual concern about, uh, about going, going out. But that's one of the, the big unknowns, how people will behave. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch. So, so let's shift a little bit to the collapse in oil prices. Let's talk about oil. Yeah. If you think about oil, yesterday, West Texas crude spot price was about $15 a barrel. Now, that's sort of shocking. At the start of the year, it was up around $60 a barrel. We've seen this plummeting. Uh, in oil prices. Uh, you had the futures market briefly go negative here a week or so ago, but you had a price, well, you had the pandemic, which reduced demand, uh, whether we're talking air, from China, from airlines, from auto travel. And then you had Saudi Arabia and Russia, you know, get into a, a competition to try to increase market share, increase production. Uh, So the world was flooded with oil, and we had this collapse in oil prices. What what I think is absolutely fascinating is we had the United States, which is now, um, of course, the leading oil producer, arguing to boost the price of oil. If you think about over the course of your life, my (laughs) life, Brandon's life, we've always worried about, oh, my God, we've got to keep the price of oil down. But now... We're a major oil producer with what's going on in the Permian Basin in, uh, in Texas and the Bakken up in, um, in, in uh, North Dakota. Okay. I mean, fracking. We're a big energy producer. And so that fall in oil prices, which you used to think, oh, that's an unabashed, wonderful thing for American consumers when we imported most of our oil, is a, is a nightmare for the oil producers in the United States. Yeah. And the fact that it happened, it, it, all of this in, in, in conjunction with the pandemic is just so fascinating too. Yeah. How do you look at these things? I mean, Take just it. to watch oil prices, you know, the first digit where I am is one. Okay. Uh, and it's not even close to two. I mean, we're, uh, my sister lives in Texas. Uh, they're down just over a dollar. And uh, there was an interesting piece in the Wall Street the other day, a place in Wisconsin, it was 99 cents. Wow. That's... Amazing. But we can't. But we don't drive. But nobody's driving, so <laughs> doesn't really your your gas tank lasts you months yeah. and months now instead of. Well, a week and or the two. other thing too is that's helped hold down the headline rate of inflation. Mm-hmm. If you look at the last consumer price index, the March index it was up one and a half percent on a year over year basis. If you exclude food and energy, it was two point one percent. But but that. That decline in energy prices has helped uh, hold that has helped hold that down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so how about industrial production? Well, the last reading we had on industrial production, uh, it was down five point five point four percent. But if if you think about it, we've got closed auto plants. You look at what was going on in the Seattle area with Boeing, and that and that started long before, but it's obviously got a different imp- implications after the pandemic. Stay-at-home orders, firms forced to shut down. And, you know, industrial production has, uh, is declining and it's likely to continue to decline uh, in, this, uh, in, in, in this quarter. For that to sort of end, and I, I got to be careful, if you're in food processing, that sort of thing, no, that's still you know that, that that's still going, but a lot of sectors ha- have been forced to uh, have been forced to cut back, and you know as we start to ease up, you'll likely see that you know that start to start to change. 
Yeah. But we're not and there yet. No, certainly not. Um, housing is an interesting conversation because it was so much a topic of the last Great Recession. So how, how does the housing element, um, how are we impacted in this current yeah. pandemic? The housing thing is really interesting because that first quarter data that came out yesterday, housing was up. I mean, housing was doing, was doing very well. That was one of the strengths. You know, if you look at, for example, the uh, multiple listing data, the first quarter, I mean, housing was doing all right. Now, you started to see some weakening in, in late March because when you go into a, a shutdown mode, and you know the visits become more difficult or have to be done virtually. Housing is now is now declining. Uh, resales have declined. Uh, resales have declined. Uh, build confidence of builders has plummeted. Uh, it's on hold. But remember, look at interest rates. Interest rates are extraordinarily extraordinarily low. Housing was expected to be a source of strength in 2020. It's been shut down, not because of, you know, affordability because of interest rates, but because of the shutdown of the, of the institutions. There still is that underlying shortfall in the sense that we have not kept up, you know, in Oregon, for example, with the increase in population. To a great extent, that's a, it's a national issue. We've not kept up. So when things loosen up, labor market starts to improve um, with the continued low interest rates, which are likely to last for a long time. Uh, you, I th think you could see housing resume that upward, that upward trend, which is, I mean, it's all very unusual for, well, it, it'll be a new expansion, but for housing to be showing strength late in the expansion, which it was, uh, which it was uh, as of March. Uh, that, that's a different experience, but we hadn't kept up on the production side and we've seen mm -hmm. this terrific decline in interest rates. The unknown is are people going to be willing, uh, given their perhaps worries about the labor market and the like, to race out and buy a house? Yeah, that'll be really interesting because it may be an opportunity for some people, certainly refinancing mortgages. If you're, you know, what right. you were paying dropped a point, people are going to be oh. moving on that, right? Right. The refinance business has been very strong to the extent you could get through. Yeah. Uh, with the people working from home and, that, oh, and yeah. that, that sort of thing. It's kind of like the, the glut that hit the PPP program. How fast can your banker work and yeah. how fast can the SBA yeah. respond? There's only you know, so we, much volume. That's a that's a, a very good a very good point. If you think about either the PPP program or initial or filing unemployment claims, this is a pace of activity that they've never seen before. I mean, you think about state unemployment offices. For years, their problems been finding people. Right. Okay. Not not processing claims. So naturally that part of the operation is gonna get less emphasis, shrink, and then all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands. In Oregon, uh, to date, over 330,000 people have filed for initial unemployment claims. That's crazy. Yeah, and a lot of, we're hearing from our clients and, and their employees that, some who filed over a month ago still have not received a check. Yeah, I mean, I think it's starting to loosen up now, is what we're hearing. Right. But but that you know you would not have that situation in in past times. So oh no, and and, and of course it's it'll be made up. You know, it right. comes from the data filing, but it's yeah, not right. not as quick. Yeah. yeah. So 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 talk about consumer confidence and the uncertainty. So as of today, April 30th, what do we know about where we sit today? And then can you speculate about that? Um, well, the irony on the confidence is both the Michigan survey and the conference board survey came out yesterday. And consumer, as you might expect, consumer confidence has collapsed, okay? Uh, given what people, given what people have seen. Uh, now, what's it gonna, you know, it's going to take an easing of the stay-at-home orders. It's going to start to it's going to start to change when you see 
uh, the narrative change uh, and you start reading about, oh, employment may be starting to rise or hiring, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I think that'll come back, but people are gonna be shaken by the experience. I, I keep going back, because I read it a, a month or so ago, the narrative economics by, by Schiller. And if you sit, when we turn on the nightly news, I mean, it's like the new logo of the network is that virus, that little ball with all the sticks on it. That's that what thing. you see night after night after night. I'm waiting for that to change. <laughs> uh, and you start to see, oh, so-and-so is open, opening up. Uh, we had some good numbers on industrial, you know, industrial production right. or housing sales are strong. The narrative has to change because I, I, I really am concerned about people just getting buried in, yeah. you know, the repetitive. It's not like there's new news every night. It's the latest illness count. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and which is actually a nice pivot to like, you know, this discussion around access to a vaccine uh, or treatments. So, so knowing what we hear that, you know, 12 to 18 months out, it really, it, 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 puts a damper on this, oh, it's gonna be this quick recovery just as soon as everybody right. goes right. back to work. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, that's the, the magic bullet. If we were to wake up tomorrow morning and somebody said, oh, gee, we found a vaccine that works and it's readily available. And you know, that, that could ch induce people to change behavior very, very quickly. But as you say, that's not a likely occurrence. I think what that suggests, I mean, when, when will people be willing to go back into a sports stadium or climb onto a packed plane, okay? Uh, it's gonna be a while it, until, you get that, until you get that vaccine. Uh, I think that argues it's gonna be a, a restrained upturn. As we slowly loosen up, um, people start to go out, see what happens. Hopefully we don't get a, another surge in cases. There probably will be some jump, but you know, hopefully it won't be massive and we'll be able to gradually get back, to, get back towards a new normal. But the full recovery is probably gonna await the an effective treatment and a vaccine um, that gives people more confidence. Which is really um, what everybody says, all the epidemiologists and the medical community is that that doesn't happen fast, no matter how no. fast we want it to happen. It has to go through its course, right? Yeah. Although I, I, it's interesting, the number of people globally working on this uh, and relaxing protocols and changing regulations to get stuff going faster, you know, hopefully yeah. it'll... Unprecedented. So yeah. we may be able yeah. to, to move it quicker. All right, so, so let's talk about um, uh, the behavior of people and companies post-COVID. Yeah, um, jump in there, John. What do you, what do you think about well, like remote work and things like that? Well, it, the longer term effects. What are we, I mean, look at what we're doing this morning. Okay. Uh, how many, you know, your, people are doing Zoom meetings, more webinars, that sort of thing. And then you start to say, hey, okay, do we need to have as many in-person meetings? Okay. Um, I'm on a board. The last two meetings, which have all been on life-size television, life-size television screens. Haven't had to go to Seattle or Portland. Um, will people realize, hey, this works okay. The technology's good. Maybe that will, maybe that'll change us. Um, I think you'll see businesses that have been shocked now start to worry more about resiliency. Okay. Okay. Gee, maybe I should have more capital and maybe I shouldn't be as highly, uh, as highly leveraged. Uh, maybe I better look at my supply chain and see how that thing works. You know, we had just always placed orders. We don't necessarily know where the stuff was made or, you know, how many different suppliers we had? We might have gone through a gone through a middleman. Suddenly, people will start paying more attention to that. You know, nationally, 
we, you've seen the discovery that a lot of the raw materials for some of the medicines come out of India and China in an effort to hold down costs for generic stuff. Um, right. You know, you probably see moves to develop, uh, develop alternative sources. I'm not saying bring it all back, but some of it here, some of it in, in other countries, but just to diversify. So you're not going to be as not going to be as uh, as dependent. One of the things about the supply chain stuff, given the outbreak of the protectionist sentiments that we've seen uh, in the last uh, the last couple of years, some of that had been starting to unwind. Um, stuff coming out of China, maybe going into you know Vietnam or India or or, or other places or Mexico or Canada. Uh, developing alternatives, and I think this is going to speed that speed that process. I'm not saying total deglobalization; that's not going to happen. Nor would we want that. Nor would we want that to uh, uh, want that to happen. Uh, but I think that it, there'll be a little bit more. People will be a little more careful, and you'll likely see seen a lot of talk about regional groupings. Okay, you serve your North American markets from North American producers, mm. um, not just in the United States, maybe Canada, Mexico. You serve your Asian consumers from an Asian, um, you know, market right. uh, market arrangement. There, are, there may be some more moves toward uh, toward that. Yeah, interesting. And then, and the, the, let's talk about the deficit. I mean, what? Yeah. Yikes! Now, <laughs> uh, it's 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 fascinating that. Now, the Congressional Budget Office uh, late last week, we think the deficit this year is going to be a little under $4 trillion. <clears throat> You've had massive increases in spending and, of course, weakening in, some of the, weakening in some of the revenues. Now, you haven't heard a lot about it lately, uh, but it's going to take the debt-to-GDP ratio in the United States over 100% this year. It's going to take us back nearly to where we were at the end of the Second World War, okay, when we, you know, we had massive spending. This year, the deficit is expected to be again the CB Congressional Budget Office uh, about 17 to 18 percent of gross of gross domestic product. Huge. Okay. Now. Is it a problem now? Have you seen a big run up in interest rates? Have you seen a surge in inflation? Is anybody not willing to buy U.S. paper? That stuff's not happening. Okay, but this will end, and when we start to get the upturn, that debt's still going to be there. Okay, and so you know there'll be an interest payment burden on that, and rates are extraordinarily low and have been there for a while. But at some point in time in the future, they're likely to be higher. That interest burden will rise. Okay, mm -hmm. that will potentially crowd out other things the government wants to do. Uh, that's a long term. That's a long term issue. And then you know we've still got this problem of an aging population with all the demands that come from Social Security, Medicare, that sort of thing. That that's still out there. Okay. Right. Right. So that's off the front pages, but it's an issue. It's an issue that will have to be dealt with down uh, down the road. Yeah. I'm old. You and Brandon will have to deal <laughs> with it. Great. Thanks, John. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about the generational impacts to uh, what's happening. So starting with retirees or pre-retirees, what's going through the mind of those well, folks? Um, I think if the, the experience of different generations is going to be is very, is very different. Let's suppose you're a, somebody in your, your early 60s, say maybe 62, 63, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to retire at 65. Okay. Then what happens? Whoops. My stock, the stock market's down by about 25%. My 401k, which hit a record in February, okay. It's now down by a down by a quarter. I've lost my job. Okay, yeah. what am I going to do? Okay, um, <clears throat> do you? You may have to work longer. Okay, 
Uh, now, the other thing, and that this is sort of a worrisome, but is some people could, ret could go say, okay, I'm going to tap Social Security at 62, which you can do, okay. but your monthly benefit is reduced. Okay. Yeah. And you got to live with that for the rest of your life. So it, it, it may, in, or people say, I've lost my job, maybe I'll dip into my retirement funds now. That could cause, that can cause a problem. Now, the, the, some of the legislation has loosened up for people. You don't have to take the required minimum distribution. Uh, if you hadn't started, hadn't uh, started taking it, you could delay that, that sort of thing. But that's a problem. And a lot of people who've post retirement watch that portfolio go down and they're not going to go back in the labor force, but it may indu impede their spending. Yeah. And then you've got, Brandon, we were joking about this yesterday, <laughs> but you got young people like Brandon, who this is the second time they entered the labor force during the great, during the, the what is now 2008, called the great I, I started working in 2008. I've been through yeah. two of these now. <laughs> you, you started in the great, in the great recession. And then here we are, uh, basically 12 years later, you get slammed again. <laughs> A lot of the people of that generation, two months ago, they were doing pretty well. Uh, I mean, you, you had uh, strength in the labor market. Uh, they, they were rising as a share of new home buyers. They put off marriage and family and that sort of thing. And now we're getting going and then you get hit again. Now, you know, so different people are affected differently. Another sort of interesting one I think is relatively unskilled people uh, in the sense of, oh, okay, high school or less graduation, um, they've been hit very hard. And two months ago, that was the cadre that was doing extraordinarily well. I mean, for them in the sense, rapidly rising incomes, the tight labor markets were giving them opportunities. Uh, it was a, a very positive development. And if you look at the demographics of the layoffs, for example, in, in Oregon, it's concentrated amongst young people and people with lower, with less, with high school or less education. Now, I think some of that fits with the leisure, hospitality, restaurant stuff is, is a part of that. But they've been hit very hard by that uh, in going very quickly from one of the best environments that groups had to a very weak one. And I think it's interesting that group is also the ones who many of them have lost their jobs, they're on unemployment, and they might be making more on unemployment than they were making when they were working. And what does that do to your psyche <clears throat> as we come well, out of this? And you got to get back to work eventually, right? Yeah, I, that's going to be, a, that could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, but no, there's no question that that's, that, that that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sort of goes into this whole, um, you know, how do let's kind of pivot to the business leaders as business leaders? How do we make decisions in such an uncertain environment when the future is so, so uncertain? Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, there is a uh, there is a new book uh, by Mervyn King called Radical Uncertainty. Okay. And I'm not all the way through it yet, but he uh, it's talking about the difference between risk, uh, risk and uncertainty. And, you know, you can, in risk, people put probabilities like insurance claims, that, that, that sort of thing. But he's talking about go beyond that. What we are experiencing right now, in a sense, is unimaginable. Go back and, and December 31st, where we sitting around saying, hey, um, um, <laughs> What if the government were to shut down everything? And we weren't talking about that. Hadn't happened no before, way. but gee, it happened, okay? Um, I think a business owner, you gotta think about the notion of resiliency. You probably gotta think about, wow, I better get a line of credit and have that kind of stuff available. You've seen companies with that, been able to pull them down to help them get, get through this examine the supply chain. 
maybe spend some time thinking outside the box. What are some maybe low probability things or things we haven't even thought about that could really hit us? Okay. All of a sudden, we got to think. I think we have to we have to think that way. Then I think from some business owners, when this ends, there'll be um, interesting opportunities out there. Uh, there will be some uh, firms that will not make it, that will not reopen. Uh, there will be assets, people that one might be able to use to, uh, you know, to expand or to grow your, to grow your own business. Uh, you know, yeah. there's some off the top of my head thoughts anyway. Yeah, I mean, out of adversity uh, comes a lot of innovation and, and new ways of thinking. And, I, and this will clearly change our world, right? So, oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting to watch, you know, looking on the, when you go online, I mean, how companies have pivoted, you know, distilleries to make an hand sanitizer or, or uh, you know, various sort of clothing companies to make in, make in mass, mm -hmm. showing an incredible sort of flexibility, entrepreneurial kinds of act, uh, act, activity. Uh, look at meal delivery services and grocery delivery services, how that stuff has grown and changed. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, yeah. And hopefully that we'll be able to cushion the human tragedy and impact uh, impact of it. Absolutely. Right. Well, uh, we have a couple questions, I think, from sure. our, our uh, participants. Brandon, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump you know back I mean? in. So uh, feel free at this point to use the, the Q&A option on, on Zoom to uh, ask any questions. We, we already have a ton, so keep them coming. We'll just, Ann and I will kind of look through and, and choose some of the ones that we want to ask. So I think the one the one question that we've we got a lot during registration and, and even it's on my mind, it's, I'm sure it's on Ann's mind, and this is going to be speculatory, of course, John, but, you know, based on what we're seeing with other countries, uh, sort of lifting the stay at home orders and getting back to work, getting back out in, in the communities, how, how quickly do you think we'll adapt in the United States or, or Oregon for that matter, returning to work, getting out and spending money? Like we talked about sports stadiums. I, I have a share of Trailblazers season tickets. I'm not really excited to go sit in a stadium with 20,000 other people. I'm excited to watch them on TV, but not go sit with 20,000 people. Uh, I'll be staying at home, and I'm sure I'm going to adjust my, the way I'm spending my money and going out in the community. But what, what are your thoughts overall about that? Well, I mean, you're you're exactly right. It's going to take it's going to take time for people to feel comfortable. I suspect going back into the stadiums and crowds that awaits the vaccine that we were talking about talking about earlier for people to have the confidence, uh, the confidence to do, to do that. But so you, you very likely will see, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, sports stuff broadcast, but not, you know, without, without fans for a while. Um, it, it's going to take a long time. Uh, people are going to have the narrative, as I said earlier, the narrative is going to have to change. People are going to have to get more, more confident. If all of a sudden they start, or they start to see over an extended period, declines in the number of cases, declines in the number of number of deaths. Uh, we get in the habit of the social distancing, um, wearing masks in a lot of publications. We'll gradually venture out. Now, that what I think what that means is there's no V-shaped recovery in the sense we plummet and then stay down here for a couple of weeks and then come screaming back. Uh, I don't think that's the most likely course of action. You could use the analogy, it may be more like a Nike swoosh. <laughs> we, we go down and then it's a long nice time ease. up. And you know, it's interesting, probably from a technical standpoint, we'll probably be growing again by the third quarter. I mean, the second quarter is going to be horrid. The Congressional Budget Office uh, forecasts, as well as the National Association of Business Economists, we're looking at a decline at an annual rate of 30 to 40 percent. Okay, but then as it opens up and you know production starts up, then the decline stops. 
it's not going necessarily going to be a, a giant surge in activity, but the decline will stop and will start up slowly. In that technical sense, the recession's over. Okay, mm. but the recovery could take a long time, and I. And it's all going to depend. We don't know. Nobody knows how long it's going to take for people to relax the restrictions. You know, you've got different countries doing things different ways. We'll have to see what we'll have to see what uh, what works. Uh, you know, if we relax the restrictions and restaurants have to go to half their half their capacity, are they going to be able to survive? Okay. Interesting interesting questions. And the airline business, I mean, you've got thousands of planes uh, stored, okay, curtailments in production, and that's obviously a big deal in the Northwest, separate from the 737 MAX, uh, the MAX issue. When are we going to get, get back to that? That could take, you know, that could take years. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's actually an interesting, um, as an, an economics Professor, uh, one of the questions that came in is, are we headed for a depression? And, and what, so what are the, the, what's that criteria look like and what do you think about that? Well, I'm not sure, quite honestly, I'm not sure how we actually define uh, a depression. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that we have, of course, the 1930s uh, at, as an example. And from a quarterly standpoint, we may see a annual rates of decline in output declines in employment uh you know approaching those numbers but that was stretched out over a period that was stretched out over oh, yeah. a period of, of years and you did not have the income support program uh, that were in place the federal reserve at that point in time blew it uh, uh, mm -hmm. and so, so i think that i think that's different the curtailments or contractions recessions are defined by the three Ds, the depth, the duration, and the diffusion. Now, there's no question this is going to be a very deep decline, okay? But the duration could be quite short, okay? And diffusion, yeah, it's very broad-based through the economy. Those are the three Ds that you think about when, a, when we're talking about a, a contraction. The, the rate in this one is astounding, and that's outside our, our, our norm, norm of experience. Uh, but um, hopefully the duration is going to be short. That's why it's important to think about those policy actions that have been, uh, that have been put in place. And I think you're seeing around the country, people are starting to sort of chafe at the bit at the, at the, at the restrictions. Um, yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah, there's a, there's another uh, another point that you know raised by your your question is one of the things you know the serious declines that we've had before whether we're talking about the Great Depression or we're talking about 2007 to 2009 is the leftovers from a government policy standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 1930s that's where Social Security came from. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, you also had assistance for uh, assistance for housing. Um, you look at um, 2007 to 2009, you had different rules put in place for financial institutions. You look at 9-11, you had, you know, the Homeland Security Department. And the, the shocks result in changes in policy that persist. Okay. Now, it's interesting to think what's going to come out, what's going to come out of this one. Okay. Uh, we have adopted this first time we've done this, the uh, extended and accelerated unemployment compensation. That's new in the United. That's new in the United States. Compensation for people who are, you know, gig workers and mm -hmm. you know, that's new. That, that kind of stuff is new. You think about the medical. You know, under the Affordable Care Act originally, there was a mandate to have insurance or pay a penalty. Okay, that was repealed. Well, now the idea of having a, a people without coverage in a medical pandemic, you better look at that. Okay, yeah. and 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 the 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 family leave stuff. 
or sick leave, paid sick leave. When you got a pandemic, you don't want people coming to work. Right. Uh, you want them to be able to stay home. You've seen a spread of that. There'll very likely be more emphasis, uh, more emphasis on that. Yeah. John, what are your thoughts on education system, short term and long term? Like short term, we've you know people like Anne, people like me who have kids that are still at home. We've had to become homeschooling parents and, and yeah. work through technology. And, and that's a short term thing. And it didn't seem like the system was really set up for that. And then long term, do you see it changing as a result of the situation? Well, that, 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 that's, a great, that's a great question. What I think is, you know, let's face it, education doesn't change very rapidly. Uh, <laughs> this is, no, this forced a change very, very quickly. And all of a sudden you start thinking about it. Well, you better make sure every kid's got a computer and broadband access or internet, internet access. Uh, that kind of stuff's going to get more attention. And there may be some models that, um, that, work, that work well. My daughter is a junior high science teacher in Southern California. All that stuff's gone. All that stuff's gone online. You know, they made sure each kid had a computer, that, that, you know, that sort of thing. We'll learn from the experience and maybe get set up, um, you know, so that this can be on a reserve, uh, a reserve basis when we have to. If we have this set up, it may help us deal uh, more formally with kids who are sick. Can't miss yeah. school. Hey, it's okay. You go to this. That's you know, right. You're going to get you're going to get maybe a little bit more accustomed, uh, accustomed to that. Uh, a lot of colleges, same thing to go into online, uh, online classes. And we'll, you know, we'll learn from the experience how we do it. I mean, presumably, I mean, one professor could deal with not just with 30 or 200, but with thousands of, of people. So it may enhance the dissemination of the knowledge. No, not the And I'm curious, like the, with the socioeconomic statuses, I mean, some people have access to internet and equipment. And I worry about, you know, kids getting left behind, not having equipment oh. and internet access. I mean, that's a real Absolutely. problem. But that, but that question leaps to the fore when you're forced to do this. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I believe it was Seattle and one of the districts, they had got contributions to make sure every kid got, got a computer. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's going to move us in that, move us in that direction. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I, I think um, when we talk about, you mentioned resiliency and, and entrepreneurialism, like <clears throat> we are, we, we will pivot, right? As we have in the past and we will in the future. And there are some interesting um, and, and even exciting things that could come out of this. It's scary right now. And, yeah. you know, that's something that we have to, we have to work our way through, but there is hope on the other side, right? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, we, we worry a lot about stuff, but if you look back, it's a remarkably flexible system. Uh, you know, all, like the, all of a sudden the pivoting toward developing the vaccine by tons of companies, there is a flexibility in the, the market system that lets that, that, lets that happen. Uh, and that's, our, that's, been our, that's been our strength and hopefully it will continue uh, to be our strength. And do you want to get one more question in? We're almost at the hour. Choose your favorite question out of the audience. <laughs> send oh us goodness. home. And by the way, as Ian's going to ask the question, we're, we are recording this, so we'll send it out to you uh, following the session. And, and we'll also include a survey in there uh, just to see how you like the session. If you want more stuff like this, I mean, we can bring John back as, after you guys feet wet with the, this first one. <laughs> Maybe we'll have him back again, right? That's right. That's right. Well, so the several questions came in about 2021, John, and, I, and we've kind of danced around that a little bit. We, there's a lot of unknowns, but can you, can you say anything about 2021? Well, let's put it this way. Assuming that we get a nasty short recession, declines through, at the end, through the second quarter, then we start to loosen up, the economy bottoms out, then I think you'll see growth in the second half of this year. We'll still be down for the year, but I think you'll see growth and I think you'll see uh, growth in, 2000, uh, in 2021. 
barring some other uh, <laughs> event, uh, some other event out there. But I think you've got the support stuff put in place uh, and with the relaxation of restrictions, a gradual improvement in confidence, uh, I think you'll see gro you'll see growth a uh, growth return. Because remember, you're getting this this kind of support stuff is happening all over the world. Yeah, you know? we are all going through this. That's another amazing thing, just sociologically about this. The entire planet is going through this together. That's right. Yeah, but John, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, hey, thanks. we just got a comment and ending this session saying more John Mitchell, please. So <laughs> I think we're Mitchell. gonna have to have you back. So th thanks for for uh, for doing thanks. this. It's a nice experiment. I think it worked well, well. and great job on the interview. Thanks for for doing this and, <laughs> and jumping in as well. And hey, thank you. This was it was it was fun. It was not the Listen. terror I expected. All right. yeah, we had, so we had a hundred over 150 people tune in today. So it's a value topic and you provided a lot of valuable information so be safe everybody be well and uh, we'll catch you soon All right. thanks. thanks thank you Brandon thank you John